Well, uh, welcome to yet another installment of our ARM Scientific Machine Learning Seminar uh, series. It's a great pleasure to welcome today Michael Dunham from Memorial University, who will talk about his PhD research on semi-supervised machine learning algorithm. Uh, please take it away, Michael. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, Alex did a bit of an introduction there, but I thought I would just briefly give a little bit about my my background and where I'm from. So. Um, I'm originally from Colorado, and I did my undergraduate degree at Colorado School of Mines in geophysical engineering. And then I came here to Memorial to do my master's and finished that in 2017. That work I did uh, forward modeling of electromagnetics data using um, a finite element um, code. I didn't write it, I was using a, someone else's code. <laughs> um, but uh, my, my PhD, I started in mid-2017, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm hopefully going to be finishing that soon. So uh, this is kind of at, at the you know, last stage here of my PhD. And for the, the past year, I've been working part-time for a mining services company where um, at least my role for them is a, a geodata scientist where we do uh, machine learning for mineral exploration type problems and so the the, the application that i'll be talking most about today is um, it's not from my work at gold spot but it's kind of related <laughs> so um, so i thought i'd start a little bit about uh, a motivation for for this work and you know a lot of this will probably be familiar to those of you who are uh, familiar with machine learning but in, in Earth science, our, our, our objective is to sort of understand how geologic information is distributed sort of beneath the ground or across the surface of the Earth. And we can gain insights to this geologic information by collecting data, say, you know, geophysics, geology, geochemistry, et cetera. And we can use that data to generate models. And, you know, traditional modeling techniques such as forward modeling and inversion use known physical relationships or mathematical relationships to generate models from these data. So like I'm sort of demonstrating the inversion concept here. However, uh, inversion might not be possible if this uh, forward operator is too complex or unknown. And so that that poses a, a, cha a challenge for some situations. However, there might still be situations where Maybe this G is really complex, but maybe sometimes we still have constraints on what the model should be at certain locations. So like this could be, you know, uh, we have a drilled well, and so we know like what the physical properties of the rocks are at, at certain depths. Or we might know what the lithology is of certain, um, or what the geologic units are at certain depths. Or, you know, a geologist has maybe gone out and done some field sampling. So like we know, you know, at certain locations what the model should be. But we don't have an explicit relationship to sort of leverage that information. And so this is where machine learning can play an important role, um, where we can essentially learn an implicit relationship to go from our data to the model using these constraints. So that's kind of the idea of supervised learning and, and training data. And so this relationship that we learn with supervised learning, we can use that to make model predictions, essentially, where there are no constraints. And so. In this analogy, you can kind of think of these constraints as being your labeled data set. And so if we look at this just from more of a machine learning perspective now, um, this is kind of what um, how we, we, we can represent supervised learning, where we have some, some features and we're trying to learn a relationship or a mapping between those features and the labeled data, or what as I was calling before, these constraints. And then we can use that mapping to make predictions for the data that, that don't have labels. However, there's a, an issue with this when our number of labeled data or our constraints are quite minimal. And so this can lead to rather unstable predictions for these data. And so another type of machine learning that helps mitigate this issue is semi-supervised learning, where essentially we're incorporating the unlabeled data into the training process. And so if, if I return to this uh, inversion analogy that I uh, began with, you know, when, 
we have more model parameters than we do data, that leads to an underdetermined inverse problem. And so you can kind of think of supervised learning in that situation when we have limited training data. And so you can kind of think of supervised learning as perhaps where, when we're just trying to minimize the data misfit and, and that still leads to an underdetermined inverse problem. But the way we mitigate that is we incorporate regularization into the inversion. And so what some people have interpreted semi-supervised learning as is essentially incorporating the unlabeled data is a form of regularization to help smooth out the model. Um, so that's sort of the idea behind semi-supervised learning. And so for many geoscience applications, you know, we, we don't we don't necessarily know what if there is any sort of explicit relationships to use traditional modeling techniques. And um, a lot of them are inherently challenged with limited training data. And so this makes semi-supervised learning a, a good tool to use in these situations, but it's traditionally been relatively unexplored. Um, and so that's sort of been the focus of my PhD is to see if, if these sorts of techniques can be useful in these situations. And so my PhD is focused on three different types of geoscience problems, um, well log classification, seismic classification, and uh, bedrock lithology mapping. And so this little example here is just kind of showing an example of bedrock mapping or geology mapping where we have some, you know, we know where some outcrops of geology are and we have some airborne geophysics data and we can try to, you know, use machine learning to figure out what the geology should be where we, we where we don't know. And uh, I'll I'll sort of give more of like a teaser <laughs> of the of these first two. So I just have one slide on each of these and then the majority of my presentation will be focused on this third application here. So the, the first one, uh, well log classification. Um, this is a real data set. And so it's consisted of 10 wells um, that were drilled in this area in Kansas in the United States. And so each well consists of a set of features. And so we call these um, the different measurements um, using logs. And so you can think of those as, as the features for the problem shown here. And uh, there's a total of nine different classes. And so the, the classes are related to um, lithologies <clears throat> or geologic units identified from core samples. So each of these wells has a set of data and core samples. And so um, core is actually really expensive to collect and maintain. So most wells don't typically acquire core. And so that's your, your best indication of what the lithology is, but we typically don't have it. Um, and so I, I took this data set and I sort of simulated a situation where we had limited chaining data, where I only assumed I knew what the core labels were in one of these wells. And then I was using that information to predict what the labels should be in the remaining nine wells. Um, so you can imagine here, these labels here are just for one well, and I'm trying to predict what the labels are for the remaining nine. And uh, this uh, viewer here is just a prediction for one of those nine wells. And so we have the, the true labels here. These here are just some of the, the data, some of the features. And the supervised prediction here uh, was using um, a, um, XG boost, a, a gradient boosting decision tree method. And you can see that the um, predictions are quite noisy compared to the truth. And this here just suggests what I was saying earlier, that supervised learning is prone to overfitting <laughs> in these situations. And I used uh, two different semi-supervised methods. One of them was a label propagation technique um, combined with self-training. I'll talk more about label propagation in a minute. And then um, this one here was using a semi-supervised Gaussian mixture models technique. Um, and so you can see with both of these, um, the predictions are much smoother and, and they match the truth better. And so this just is supporting this idea I said earlier about how semi-supervised techniques are, are kind of like a regularized version of the supervised problem, giving us kind of smoother, cleaner predictions. So that's kind of the idea. And then I also took these ideas and I applied them to a seismic classification problem. Where for this one, this was a, a synthetic example where I had a model 
And I was basically just trying to create a machine learning problem with this model. And so I generated data from this model and I generated my, my, my input features. And these are called seismic attributes. And from this model, I can also generate the, the labels that I'm gonna be using. So um, this here is like the, the ground truth model, what the labels are for the entire area. And similar to the previous problem, I'm only going to assume I know what the labels are at one location. So you can think of this as like a drilled well. And so at that well location, we know what the labels are, but we don't know what they are for the rest of the model. And so, you know, that was sort of my, my limited training data for this problem. And I used that to make predictions for the rest of the model. And so the supervised prediction using, again, XGBoost is, is given here. And then this is one of my semi-supervised predictions. And uh, the performance metrics just briefly are summarized here at the top. And uh, notably what's different is the precision uh, between these uh, two predictions. And so the, pre the precision for the semi-supervised method is much higher. And you know, precision is related to sort of minimizing false positives. And so uh, this is important for exploration type work because um, you know, there's a lot of risk when drilling wells because you don't want to drill a well where because this the, the whole idea here is to try and drill hydrocarbons. And so you don't want to drill a well in an area <laughs> that doesn't have hydrocarbons. There's a lot of risk with that. And so um, if we can produce um, model predictions that are suggesting, or especially with semi-supervised, if there's a higher precision, then this would suggest that this model has um, less risk in giving you a false positive. Um, so that, that's sort of the idea here with that. And so now I'll transition into the more, um, to the problem I talk a bit more about in this presentation, which is using these same ideas, but for um, lithologic mapping. So this idea is kind of used more in the context of mineral exploration. And so this here is not my work. This is just an example of the literature that I'm going to show you to kind of get you primed for what, um, what I essentially did. So we have a number of features, and so these can be acquired um, like airborne geophysical methods. So we have um, gravity, we have magnetics, and then we have radiometrics. It's kind of like a, an airborne geochemical survey, <laughs> more or less. So it, it gives you um, information pertaining to different elements like potassium, uranium, and thorium. And then here, like the, this particular example is using a digital elevation model as well. And so what they've done is they've just assumed that they know what the lithology is at certain locations. So these are the little dots on, on this map. And so you can think of that here as, as the training data. And they should, what's traditionally been used are obviously supervised techniques where they're trying to use this information to make predictions for the rest of the map. And then that's what's provided here on the right-hand portion of the slide. And you can use the class membership probabilities to derive this um, feature called entropy. So this kind of measures like the disorder in the prediction. So if you have high entropy, that suggests that the models, the, the prediction is not really confident in the predictions in that area. And so that might suggest areas that uh, might need refinement in some way. But um, you know, semi-supervised methods have not really been used for this type of application. And so I, I'm extending these ideas to using these different types of techniques. So uh, the, the data I got for this, the, the study I um, did for my PhD is a, is a real data set. And I got it from Australia of all places. <laughs> um, they have a really good um, public repositories for downloading data. Um, it, it's really fantastic. So if you're ever looking for data to try something um, in terms of geophysics oriented data, they have and geologic data, they have lots of good stuff there. And uh, so the, the particular survey that I chose is in this little red square. And it had uh, radiometrics and magnetics data. And they have a really nice uh, geologic map available as well, like as recent as 2021, where they put a lot of work into it. And so that's another piece of information that I was able to leverage. So how I set up a problem for this is, um, you know, I just mentioned that they have a really reliable geologic map. And so this I'm going to kind of use as my ground truth. 
And similar to that example, I'm going to essentially subsample that map in different ways to simulate different exploration style scenarios. Um, and then I'm going to sort of vary how that sampling is done with different experiments. And the goal is to sort of obviously make predictions for the rest of the map. And uh, you know, I'll compare the performance of different supervised and semi-supervised techniques and, and see how they compare. So uh, you know, I'll kind of break this down into its certain into its uh, components to help make it a little more clear. Um, so first, I'll talk a bit about the the input features. Um, so as I mentioned, the data uh, originally has magnetics, which is um, the standard product is reduced to pole magnetics, and these three channels of radiometrics. But four features alone, I assume, was probably not going to be enough to distinguish the classes of interest. So I did some, some feature expansion techniques that are kind of common in, in geophysics for these different types of uh, inputs. So for magnetics, you can do various things like computing residuals. Um, this kind of removes the long wavelength information. Um, you can do upward continuation, which removes the short wavelength information. And you can kind of, since I didn't have gravity data, there's a way you can sort of simulate what the gravity would look like based off of the magnetics. And then for radiometrics, um, you can, a lot of people will compute ratios of different elements, and uh, which is what I've done here, or, and you can kind of combine them all into one um, to try to have like a, a combined uh, feature. And I also computed um, texture features based on the first derivative of the RTP. And this is, uh, those of you who may or may not be familiar with um, texture features, but they're the uh, Harlech texture features that are used, that were used kind of back in the day for um, extracting information out of images. And so I'll just briefly kind of show what some of these features look like, just so you can kind of have an idea. So this here is just the RGB composite of the radiometrics. And so um, the, the RGB sort of key is here and so you can see a lot of things are pink <laughs> in this image and so sort of red and, and pink is relating to potassium and so uh, what a lot of what you're seeing here um, are elevated values of potassium and these are related to granitic intrusive bodies um, so granite um, tends to have a lot of potassium in it and so uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of geologic units here that are high in potassium. And then this here is just uh, one of these ratios, and you can see how it, it can pick up sort of some differences within these different um, igneous intrusives. So that's a bit about the radiometrics data. And for the magnetics, um, you know, we can kind of see some different things here. Some of these igneous intrusives have some elevated magnetics values. And some, some of them are sort of blank. There's no magnetic signature really to them. And uh, this here is just what that pseudo gravity <laughs> feature looks like. It's trying to simulate what gravity would look like based off the magnetics. It, it tries, but um, still kind of looks like the magnetics in a way. Um, and then th these are the, the texture features. And so um, this is kind of a local window based approach for sort of computing a texture based on these. So you can um, you can treat the magnetics here as like a, an image, and then you can compute this information from it. And this is what you can come up with. Um, so these are also some features that I included. So that's the, the features for the problem. And, and now I'll transition to what the, the labels look like. So this here is the geologic map. And so uh, I won't go into too much details here because I'm I'm sure most of the folks here in the audience are not um, <laughs> geologists. And so um, basically, what what's in this map? Uh, we have 21 different classes, and the majority of which are variants of um, granite type rocks. Um, and so the the only units that are not are these sort of gray units in the background, and these are more um, sedimentary to metamorphic rocks that form the background. And again, those are shown in gray. And then we have in, in orange, we have some um, basalts um, that are kind of scattered throughout the map a little bit. 
and those are the, the youngest rocks. In the so it's a little bit about the just what the what I'm assuming to be the ground truth for the problem. So the the next stage here is to um, essentially subsample this geologic map in different ways to simulate different training scenarios that would be realistic for a, bed, a bedrock mapping problem. And uh, just for the size of the problem, um, I'm assuming that the this is dis discretized in 100 meter cells. Same with the, the geophysics inputs before. And uh, it gives me about 400,000 points, more or less. So it's not a huge problem. We're not, we're not dealing with like millions and millions of data points, like some you know big data type problems. Uh, so it's not big, but it's not a small problem. Um, but I guess coming back to uh, the different ways I'm going to generate training data, there's three different ways. And so I'll, I'll highlight what each of these represent. So the first one in training um, situation A, we can think of this as kind of like an early exploration stage if you're doing mineral exploration where um, you know, geologists are sort of deployed out onto the landscape and they may just walk along certain transects, and I guess this is actually fairly common. And they're and they're sort of mapping the area along these transects. So these these black lines are representing transects that a geologist has walked along, and they're and they're mapping and making notes along the way about what the lithology is. And so um, an interesting thing with this is that, which is quite realistic, is that you will likely not sample all of the uh, map units um, with this approach. So what actually happens here is that only 16 of the 21 lithologies are sampled with this. So the other five are going to be classified as um, one of the 16 it can train on, because that, that's all it can do. Um, but the number of training data is, is quite limited. So we're dealing with a fraction of 1%, and this is actually quite, quite typical. So this is training situation A. Uh, training situation B, you know, geologists will they'll have field stations, and so they'll do sort of like a a local kind of reconnaissance mapping around that location. And you can think um, as each of those locations is representing a polygon with a certain uh, radius. And so um, that's what these little black dots are representing across the map. And so I did this in such a way so that each lithology at least got sampled by one polygon. <laughs> um, so in this situation, all the lithologies are, are sampled. But again, I'm keeping the training data relatively consistent. So the, the number of training data is being kept constant between each of these scenarios, but how that training data is sampled is what is varying. So that, that holds true for the last situation where I'm assuming the, the training data are, are very dispersed um, across the map. And so you what can also happen is a geologist will go around and, and they'll they'll just grab little samples from uh, across the landscape and they'll bring those back and analyze them. So they call them these grab samples. And uh, so these I have these kind of random randomly distributed across the map. And uh, again, the number of trained data is almost the same as before, so you know less than half a percent. And so the main difference between again all of these is is how the training data is distributed, and you'll see the impact of this in the results here in a minute. But the, the last situation I wanted to explore was that if we had no training data at all, so this can also happen, you know, if you're in very, like the Canadian Arctic, where it's very difficult um, to get geologists out there to sample the, um, the bedrock. And so you might be limited to only using unsupervised methods in that situation because because you have no ground truth. But for this problem, you know, I, I, I do still have training data. And so the, the, the question that was coming to me is um, what value can unsupervised learning provide when there is still training data available? And, you know, when you have really limited training data, like, you know, one could actually ask, like, is it safer <laughs> to use unsupervised learning? Because maybe the training data is just too limited that you know, you're, it, it's really biasing your problem in a way that you don't want. Um, so these are some important questions that I thought would be worth um, an, um, answering. And so I haven't talked about machine learning methods at all yet, and so that's what I will, I'll get into now. So I, I've basically set up the problem, but now I need to address which methods I'm going to use to solve that problem. 
So the, the, the semi-supervised method I, I tended to use quite a bit is called label propagation. And so the, the method kind of is as it sounds, where it, it spreads the labels from the known points to the unknown points. And I'm kind of demonstrating that here with this figure on the left. So this is done um, first by constructing what is called an edge weight matrix. And this is done, um, this matrix is computed based on all of the data. So the training data, or, you know, the label data and the unlabeled data. And there's two different ways. Um, the, the sort of RBF approach creates a dense matrix, which gets problematic when you have large data sets, um, even for this problem, which had less than half a million cells, it would have required like over a thousand gigs of RAM <laughs> um, to, to run, which kind of became problematic. Um, but you can use a, a nearest neighbors sort of kernel, which, um, you know, rather than having a matrix that for, that's 400,000 by 400,000, I can have a matrix that's 400,000 by like 100, which is what ended up being 100 nearest neighbors worked out quite good for this problem. So it reduces the computational load significantly. And uh, essentially this weight, this edge weight matrix is thrown into compute what's called a normalized Laplacian matrix. And then that is sort of the, the meat of the spreading function. So that information is incorporated into here where we contain a matrix that has the initial labels, Y, and uh, we're trying to, we use this iterative spreading function to, uh, it sounds, spread our labels to the unlabeled. And sort of what these little uh, thick end lines are showing here are sort of the unlabeled points that receive the most information from their from a given label will receive that um, from a given class will receive that label. So like these points here, the 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 lines that have the the, the thickest lines attached to them. Um, are 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 coming from label two. And so, you know, these unlabeled data receive the most information from label two, and so that's what they get classified as. And so you can see the same for that up here for the situation for class one. And so that that that's kind of how the you get a class membership matrix in the end. Um, you know, the unlabeled data are receiving information from the the labeled data, and then whichever labeled data influences a given unlabeled data point the most is what get, it, it gets classified as. And so there's two hyperparameters for this method. There's the number of nearest neighbors um, for this kernel. And then there's this alpha. So this alpha parameter kind of gives a relative weight between the, the labeled information and the unlabeled information in this, in this function. And uh, since there's only two parameters, it does make it relatively easy to implement. And uh, one thing that's worth noting here is that this algorithm is considered what's called a transductive algorithm. So it's not a classifier in a traditional sense. Um, so it, if, if new data were to come along, I couldn't use this method to, it's not like a trained classifier where I could then use that to predict on new data. So this, is sort of internally defined based on the data that you have included in the edge weight matrix. So whatever data you've included here is the only data you can basically make predictions for. If you have new data coming in, you basically have to recreate this edge weight matrix. Um, so you have to recreate the whole thing. So that's kind of a, 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 a disadvantage of this method. Uh, but for the supervised methods, I use gradient boosting decision tree methods. Um, I use XGBoost and this other method called MyGBM. They're rel you know, relatively new methods. And uh, you know, I won't go into the details here, but um, they use this concept called boosting, which is an ensemble of, of weak learners, you know, decision trees with a low amount of, of depth to them. And they're sort of combined in a way to produce better, better results. And so the way the, the boosting process works is the given tree is trained on the data, and um, then on, in the next iteration, it's basically trying to correct the errors from the previous tree. And so, um, you know, folks sort of recast this idea in, in a gradient um, framework where they interpreted each boosting iteration as a, as a step in the direction of steepest descent. Um, so that's kind of a, just a brief um, 
high level <laughs> uh, interpretation of these uh, types of supervised methods. But for the uh, unsupervised technique, um, I use uh, a method called self-organizing maps. And so, um, you know, some clustering algorithms say, you know, the most common one like k-means, there's no sort of organization to those clusters. So you don't really know how one cluster is related to another. But uh, I guess a benefit of self-organizing maps is it introduces a topology to the clusters. So, you know, it, it gives you an understanding of how one cluster is related to another. And so I won't go into the details of how this method works. Some of you might already be familiar with this. Um, but generally, you end up having, you can interpret each self-organizing map node as being a cluster. And generally, the number of nodes you have can be a lot, <laughs> like hundreds, thousands um, of, of these nodes are in your SOM embedding, your self-organizing map embedding. But in the context of, of this work, you know, we don't have tens and thousands, tens and hundreds of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of geologic units. We tend to have much less um, clusters likely in reality. Um, and so I impose a secondary clustering on this. And I do that using a, an agglomerative clustering technique. Um, so it, it's kind of like a two-step process. And this is an approach that's actually already existing in the literature for these types of problems. I'm just kind of following suit. So um, for the for those three first scenarios I showed you, I had training data, but for scenario D, the last one was where I applied this technique. Um, and so I'll I'll show uh, the, the results from, from everything um, numerically here. Um, so this is for those first three scenarios, kind of have it broken up into three categories here. Um, for those different scenarios, and then the results for each of the techniques. And so I have the, the cross-validation performance of trying to determine the hyperparameters um, in this first data column. And then I have broken up the performance on the entire map, which is what I'm calling the, the, the testing performance based on macro precision uh, recall and F1. And so in the first scenario, we see that um, the label propagation technique is doing on, you know, on average of, of I mean, maybe like five to seven percent better than um, than light GBM. And uh, a similar case in scenario B in the outcrops example. Um, but what's interesting is in the uh, third scenario we're seeing the performance between label propagation and light GBM is about the same, um, which is interesting. And um, I'll leave this as low hanging fruit maybe for questions later. And um, if you look at some of these, you can tell that based on what the cross validation score is and what the testing scores are, that there is some overfitting <laughs> um, or what seems like overfitting that's going on here. And so there is some interesting reasons as to why this is happening. Um, especially for the label propagation technique. But um, like I said, I'll, I'll leave that as some low-hanging fruit <laughs> for questions later, perhaps. Um, so now I'll, I'll basically um, show how the results look visually um, for each of these different scenarios. So this is scenario A with the transects example, and this is this here is just the original map. I'm just showing that here for comparison. And uh, these are what the predictions look like. So I have light GBM on the left and the um, label propagation on the right. And so if I just flip back and forth between these two, um, you know, there, there are areas where both algorithms are doing pretty bad. <laughs> um, namely, I'm, I'm kind of drawn to this, this region right here. Um, it's, it's classifying this as green when it should be brown, <laughs> um, to say it simplistically. But um, when we look at sort of the, the rest of the predictions as a whole, especially these background units, uh, we see that they're much smoother in the label propagation prediction as opposed to um, light GBM. And there's some other artifacts um, like these shown here, and especially this one here, that are much more prominent in the light GBM prediction as, as compared to um, label propagation. But as I mentioned more towards the beginning of the presentation, we can also compute um, entropy from these predictions um, using the class membership probabilities. And so that's what I show here. 
And so what's what's neat with this is that even when there are areas where we know it's where the prediction is wrong, um, the entropy is actually quite high there. And so, you know, again, high entropy means that there's sort of that the prediction is more chaotic there. It's not really definitive as to what the prediction should be. There's more of a spread across the class membership probabilities. And so this is great in that it can help show us. You know, it, it helps show like where the algorithm is actually doing um, where it's actually going wrong. Um, and so that, that, that's great. And it does that for both methods. So like it's still pretty helpful in showing where um, the supervised method has, has gone away. <laughs> and so that's the first scenario. Uh, the next scenario is where um, the training data again were simulated as representing outcrops. These little these little black dots. And these are actually shown to scale. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, so again, this here is the, the original map. And then here are the predictions. And so we can see here the predictions are actually um, doing a bit better compared to the first scenario. Um, this is primarily, I think, because uh, these data are sampling each lithology. <laughs> um, and they're a little bit more dispersed. But again, similar to before, the the light GBM prediction is just a little bit noisier than the label propagation prediction. And, and that's kind of what we expect um, based on the arguments I've made earlier in the presentation. And uh, again, here are the entropy predictions, or sorry, the entropy calculations. And so, um, yeah, here, I mean, I didn't, I'm not showing it in this presentation, but there were some overfitting issues with the supervised methods in a couple of these situations where they were, when you look at the feature importances, they are heavily um, dominated by particular features. And so like the, the supervised methods are overfitting a certain feature. And so like the predictions are kind of following um, certain features very specifically. And so I had to remove those <laughs> for the supervised methods to help prevent those artifacts from occurring, but you're still kind of seeing a remnant of one right here and also right here. Um, and so you can actually see them in the predictions as well. It's not um, dramatic, but there are still some um, remnants of those issues still happening. And so now for the third situation where the chain data are quite dispersed, when we look at the prediction, they're actually pretty clean. Um, and again, the amount of training data for all three of these situations is, is pretty much the same. Um, but we do see that the performance is, is the best for all three method, for all three scenarios here, where our performance is above 70%. Whereas before, um, you know, it was hovering around um, you know, low 50s or closer to 60 for semi-supervised. Um, so uh, drastic improvements just based on how our training data are distributed. And when we look at the entropies again, we can see some interesting phenomena occurring. And it seems like most of the entropies are highest along this uh, uh, eastern portion of the map. And so that can have some interesting sort of practical implications that I'll mention later. And so for the uh, now moving on to scenario D, which is the uh, unsupervised clustering results. I'll just kind of show like kind of some of these generic outputs that we get from the self-organizing maps. And so this year is just, I consider the a self organizing map 2D grid of 50 by 50 nodes. And this year is just showing the number of points that got assigned to each node. So you can think of this as kind of like a, a 2D histogram. And uh, this year is the, the U matrix, uh, which shows the relative similarity in terms of distance between ad adjacent SOM node vectors. Um, and so this just, can kind of help show perhaps where certain regions are a little more, you know, where the U matrix is high, maybe that's kind of representing a, a heterogeneous region in um, that is representing in the actual feature space. And so, uh, like I said before, I did a secondary clustering of this where you cluster the SOM nodes. And I determined using, um, so the method I used again was hierarchical clustering. And I had to determine the number of clusters to use for that. And so um, I used DBI and Silhouette score for that. And um, I know that the clusters should have been a little bit higher, but if 
if you had no sort of a priori information, you would have been drawn to nine clusters. So something with the highest silhouette score and lowest DBI. Um, and so I did look at nine, but I also liked 11 and 13. Um, and so the results I'm showing you here are actually from 13. So this is how that SOM node space got clustered. So all of the SOM nodes that lie in this region would get assigned to a single cluster as opposed to being what would likely end up being, I don't know, maybe like 50 or more different clusters in this little area. They got sort of merged into one. This kind of helps interpreting the results a bit as opposed to having, you know, 2,500 clusters <laughs> to look at. Um, and so uh, a neat way to visualize this is to is to color these clusters based on a 2D color map. And so this can help show, you know, the clusters that are related to each other. So since we know that different, you know, based on how the SOM works, that clusters that are and nodes that are adjacent to each other in this map are going to be similar. And so we should color it in such a way that we can notice which clusters are actually similar. And so that's what I've done here. And this is actually the, the clustering result. And uh, these background units that I mentioned before, these metamorphic and sedimentary rocks um, sort of all coincide within one region of the SOM space, which is kind of neat. That's kind of what we'd expect. And then, you know, different uh, igneous intrusives are kind of grouping into certain areas of this space. So it's kind of a neat interpretation tool. And so when we compare this to the, the true geologic map, we, we do notice some similarities. Um, you know, namely, you know, this unit here actually got um, decomposed quite well um, with respect to the actual geologic map, which is kind of cool. But there's other parts of this map that um, obviously are not the same. <laughs> um, so in the predictions like this unit here is, is coming up with maybe five different clusters um, where the geologic map thinks that this is one unit. Um, and so this is something to perhaps pay attention to. Um, and, and I'll um, make a connection to that here in just a minute. But if we compare the prediction, so if we look at one of the one of the predictions, say from the, the label propagation, interestingly, um, we can see uh, one that the supervised and the semi-supervised predictions are more or less still able to pick up more information than the clustering could. So, like this. Is, as I showed before, you know, there's sort of nine to 13 clusters that the clustering is picking up. But these results here on the left are able to distinguish between the, the 21 classes. Some of them, they don't do particularly well, but arguably including the training data here, did it have some benefit? Um, but what's interesting is the unsupervised learning, where there are regions that are representing multiple clusters, like I'm showing you here. Um, if we look at the entropy, we can see that where the uh, unsupervised predictions are quite chaotic, we're actually seeing very high entropy. So where we're seeing heterogeneous areas in the clustering, we're seeing areas of uncertainty um, in the machine learning predictions for the supervised and the semi-supervised methods. So that that's, that's quite useful and quite interesting. So this, these results, these unsupervised results can kind of give a, a preemptive sort of knowledge of where we might expect our supervised or semi-supervised predictions to go wrong or to have uncertainty. And so that was sort of the value that I extracted out of this work. And so I guess just to, to summarize up uh, what I have showed you today, um, with specific regard to this situation, um, I had trained data from our simulated exploration style scenarios by sampling tra training data from that geologic map in different ways. And um, they each had the same number of training data, but how that training data was sampled varied. And then I, you know, I have that shown here on these panels on the right. And so in situations A and B, you can more or less think of machine learning as, as actually performing um, extrapolation spatially. It has to try to figure out what the lithologies are 
you know, where there is no black dots. And this is more akin to extrapolation. I mean, this is in these situations, this is where semi supervised methods actually performed better. But in scenario C, where we have the training data quite um, well distributed, you can think of this as more of performing interpolation spatially. And in this situation, you know, supervised methods were sufficient. Um, you know, there was no sort of benefit um, to using semi supervised methods in this scenario. And, you know, I just recently, um, you know, mentioned the sort of insights that we can gain um, from doing unsupervised learning in this situation. And so the, the sort of practical takeaways from this, like if you're a mineral exploration company, for instance, um, obviously uh, well distributed training data will give you better results. <laughs> Um, so that's an important thing to, you know, if you're designing field campaigns for sending your geologists out onto the landscape, um, that's an important thing to keep in mind if you're if you're anticipating using machine learning methods for for your given task. But if you are restricted to gathering, you know, spatially sparse measurements, then you can know that semi supervised methods might be better suited for you in that situation. And, you know, these entropy calculations um, can be quite helpful in indicating uncertainty. So, like, say you um, you do, like, a phase one and, you know, you gather some training data, you do some predictions, and there's still some high entropy, high uncertainty in, in certain locations. That can be areas for you to focus on in the next year. Um, you know, if you have subsequent field campaigns, to be like, hey, this is where we should go out. Um, next year to gather additional data to help refine our, our map in that zone. Um, so that's uh, all I have for you today. Um, so thanks again for inviting me and I'll, I'll be happy to try and address any questions you might have. Great, uh, thanks so much, Michael, for this really interesting talk and there is still plenty of time for questions. Uh, any, any questions from the audience? I have a question. I didn't raise my hand, Alex, but um, if anyone is ahead of me. No, no, it's, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, apologies for the webcam. Somehow uh, I'm having issues <laughs> lately. Um, it's okay, I can still hear you. <laughs> in terms of uh, the unsupervised learning, uh, have you tried, like, uh, so what have you tried? Did you? Uh, like you didn't talk about like auto encoders. Would that be something that would be suitable for this sort of data that you have? Um, that's a good question. I'm not that familiar with the, the deep learning side of the spectrum. Um, but that would be something interesting to, to try. I'm I'm a little familiar with um in encoders, but um uh, I'm not sure if they've been used that much in this space, which would be an interesting thing to try. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, other questions? But then maybe let me ask a question in the meanwhile. So you tried out a variety of uh, different methods. Have you tried it all to combine them into an ensemble method? Is that possible? I mean, you have quite diverse sort of error sources in a way you would assume if you combine them together to get sort of an even better method. Yeah, so um, that's actually a really good idea and I haven't done it. We actually do that at Goldspot, but <laughs> okay. I, um, I didn't, I couldn't, because I have to try and keep what I'm doing and what we do at the company a bit separate because there's pr proprietary reasons for mm -hmm. that, but um, definitely. So like, I know there's, um, it, it's not giving too much away from what I do with it, it, um, at the company, but um, at least for the supervised methods, um, you know, it, it's very easy to consider a, a range of different methods. So like, you know, for this example, I used, you know, different, um, gradient boosting decision trees, you could try incorporating a few others and then using like a stacking classifier, if that's what you're referring to. So where you, exactly. you, you, you merge essentially all of them together. 
Um, and so like for a multi-class problem, like your stacking classifier might be more of like a majority vote um, mm -hmm. of the outputs from the different algorithms. And, and that would perhaps maybe clean up some of the predictions a bit um, for sure. And uh, yeah, but there's, there's nothing that would prevent from incorporating uh, semi-supervised predictions into that stacking classifier for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Other questions? No one's gonna pounce on my low hanging fruit question. <laughs> well, I, I like in the meanwhile, let, let me ask one more question. I mean, yeah. so, so basically, of course, yeah, you use classical, classical machine learning. I think that that's really great. Obviously, like these days, everybody wants to do something with deep learning and so on. Yeah. Um, is it? I mean, so you, you mentioned that in the beginning, you, you will always be quite constrained in terms of the training data available because it's quite challenging to obtain. Yeah. And that then you, you say it obviously, right? Like if you have too many sort of hyper parameters, it becomes really challenging then to train these things. Do you see like any scenario at all where maybe there is a future for like deep learning in this field or do you think it's just always um, unsuitable because of the lack of training data that you have? So are you referring to semi-supervised methods in particular? Y yeah, I mean, so for example, like Hamid said, like an autoencoder seems quite natural, right? Or like even, okay, like before an autoencoder, right? Like principal component analysis, right? Is something quite simple to do. But then, yeah, if you do this, then yeah, like what's preventing you from training an autoencoder and try to basically do like the classification through the autoencoder in a way. Is that is that a, at all possible or you simply haven't tried it yet? Or is there any like particular reason why you think this wouldn't work? I yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um so I'll I'll mention something that I have done and then I'll 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 try to get um I'll try to address your question specifically. So um traditionally I have strayed away from deep learning methods for these problems, mm -hmm. primarily because the amount of training data is so limited mm -hmm. um, in these problems. So, you know, I was giving you examples where I only had, you know, a thousand training data points or less. Um, and so, you know, deep learning algorithms um, are traditionally going to need a lot more than that to, you know, train all the various weights <laughs> and biases, especially if you have like, like a deep neural network, for instance. Um, it just wouldn't work. And um, in, in, in the seismic example that I showed, I didn't show the results here, but I tried using a recurrent neural network for that problem just to sort of help address this, um, this concept of, you know, can deep learning still work in these scenarios? Um, and so if you recall for that seismic example, I know it was towards the very beginning, maybe I'll just try to go back. Um, I click home, FN home. Um, just so it's here to illustrate. So um but the the challenge with this is that when I when I did an RNN on this problem, um, you know, RNNs train on sequences, right? And so um each of these in seismic we have what are called traces. And so this well is technically one trace. And so I only have one trace <laughs> to train on, <laughs> mm -hmm. which I don't even have a validation set um, or, uh, uh, you know, or a, a testing set or, or, you know, I guess the testing is the entire rest of the data, um, but I have no validation data. So I have no way to calibrate um, how well that RNN is, is, is doing. So it was extremely difficult. Um, and so you have to regularize, you know, it extremely. Um, and so, like, I could only use one RNN layer, and I had a dropout layer, and that RNN layer only had, like, I, can't remember, I think it only had, like, 36 units in it. So, like, there's not a lot to it, because if you had it be any more complicated than that, it overfit really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for me, that was just, and, 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 and the performance that came out in the end, it actually wasn't that bad. Um, but it was basically doing the exact same as the decision tree boosting methods that I was using. 
So like you have to scale down the deep learning methods so much so they don't overfit mm -hmm. that they're really not offering any additional benefit than using the traditional techniques. Sure. Um, and so that was sort of my way of checking myself because up to that point, I had just sort of made that sort of uh, accusation that deep learning wouldn't work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and so rather than that, rather, rather than be presumptuous, I want to actually show, you know, you know, have some information to back up that claim. And so it, it turned out that that was the case, at least for that problem. Um, and, and that was a situation again, you know, like. 1000 training data points, um, or, or 1 sequence <laughs> for an RNN. Um, and so it just becomes incredibly challenging. I know there's a few, um, in this seismic realm. I know there's a few folks that have in the deep learning realm that they have created some semi-supervised approaches that kind of use different deep learning techniques. I, I, I can't remember the exact details of it, but um, I'm sure there's still a number, you know, with any sort of deep learning method. I mean, you have to figure out how many layers you want, the architecture, et cetera. So there's still a lot of figuring out what your hyperparameters, more or yeah. less. And so if you have very limited data for figuring that out, um, you're probably still going to have the same challenges. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm not convinced um, mm. that in these limited chain data scenarios that deep learning, I don't think it'll do worse, but I'm not convinced it'll do better than the, yeah. the traditional um, type methods. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Other questions? And so, otherwise, just uh, you, you can go back and uh, show us your discrepancy and sort of explain oh. it. Because uh, <laughs> it yeah, is I... rather striking, right? Like you had like close to 100%. Yeah, so, like in the... exactly. Um, so it is quite striking what, what's going on there. Let's see here. Um... So one thing that I didn't mention in this talk that um, is, so I'll come back to this in a second, but um, is figuring out the hyperparameters for semi-supervised methods. Um, it's not addressed in the literature really. And so I was kind of left to my own devices to figure out how in the hell I'm supposed to do this. Um, and because the issue is, if I just go back to the label propagation slide, um, you know, say if you use the, this RBF kernel, you know, this sigma kind of controls like the reach of uh, one data points um, to another um, for a given distance. And so this is information that incorporates the unlabeled data. So this is something that depends on sort of the nature of the unlabeled data. But when you do uh, cross validation, standard cross validation, you can only use the label data set because that's the only information that you have the knowns for. So if I'm using that limited labeled data set that incorporates no information from the unlabeled data, that it's probably going to suggest hyperparameters that aren't suitable, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these hyperparameters are kind of depending on the nature and the, and the distribution of the unlabeled data. Um, and so the earlier parts of my thesis, I had tried using the sort of standard supervised um, cross-validation approach. And I got mixed results. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes it gave me really um, bad predictions. Um, and for this work here, I came up with a new um, sort of cross-validation approach. Um, so this here is your, your standard, you know, capable cross-validation. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. Um, but as I mentioned before, the unlabeled data has such an influence on the determination of the hyperparameters. So what I decided to do was do this. <laughs> um, so when we when we do it for semi-supervised learning, we can treat this validation fold as the unlabeled data. And then um, we're basically trying to make predictions for that, which we can evaluate. Um, so this validation fold can still be incorporated during training, but that validation fold is just so tiny. Um, you know, for calling that the unlabeled data, that really does not capture you know, the sort of 
distribution of the unlabeled data as a whole. And so what we can do is we can incorporate the unlabeled data into this validation fold. And then when we make predictions, we can only evaluate the predictions on the validation fold, but at least the unlabeled data is being included. Mm -hmm. um, but you can imagine that including the unlabeled data will make this process take a heck of a lot longer. <laughs> um, and so like for this problem, the, 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 the amount of total data was like 400,000. So this didn't really make it problematic, but if you had millions of data points, um, maybe you would just use like a subset of your unlabeled data, like a random subset um, to include, to help inform the determination of the hyperparameters. Um, and so it was this approach that I used for label propagation um, in, in the study I talked most about in this presentation. And now I'll explain why some of the results looked so, the, the cross-validation results looked so wonky. Um, here we go. So um, for label propagation, like for scenario A and scenario B, you can see <laughs> the cross-validation performance is extremely high. Um, so actually the cross-validation was, for me, I considered it indeterminate. It was not helpful. Um, and it's not because I, I wasn't considering it to be overfitting. Um, it actually has to do with the distribution of the training data. So for scenario B, um, I'll just bring up the situation for this. For scenario B, the training data are coming from these little points. And so if you can imagine locally around each point, the data are gonna be highly correlated because they're coming from the same geologic unit. Um, and so if I randomly split all of these, you know, each of these black dots consists of about 15 to 20 points each, but for each black dot, those data are highly correlated. So if I randomly subset, you know, if I have five-fold cross-validation, if I'm taking 80% of those points and I'm trying to validate on the rest, when I'm doing label propagation, you know, those points are already coming from an area that are already highly correlated with the known labels. And so like, you're gonna get an extremely high cross-validation performance regardless of what parameters you use because the, the validation fold is basically coming from the same distribution <laughs> as the rest of the training data. Um, and so that's why uh, the validation um, performance is like near 100%. <laughs> Um, for label propagation, um, it's still pretty high for the supervised methods, but it's it's even more so for label propagation. And we're still seeing a bit of that phenomena in the first scenario with the transects. It's just not as pronounced um, since the data are coming along these lines. Um, so that's that's why we have some weird stuff going on with the cross validation performance. But in the distributed example, this here is where the um, determination of the hyperparameters using that approach was actually really good because each of those data points is independent. They're, they're further apart from each other. Not, they're not as correlated. So my validation fold is not as related to the information that's incorporated during the, the, the training part of the fold. And I think... Uh, but... I included the results from that. I guess I didn't. Um, it was just that there was a nice um, a nice maximum in the, um, I was determining alpha um, using the, that, that, using this approach here. Um, and there was a nice, a nice maximum at a given value of alpha um, that worked out great and it, and it was performing really well. So um, yeah, it worked out. <laughs> Um, but like I said, the the distribution of the training data has a huge impact, mm. and that's why things were kind of funky. <laughs> it always does in machine learning, doesn't it? Indeed, there's always something. Um, other other questions. If there is uh, no more questions, and thanks once again, Michael, for this really interesting talk. Um, definitely looking forward to hearing more about that. Um,
And yeah, I think this was it for the time being. Um, there is no sort of other scientific machine learning seminar planned. Um, if one of you wanted to give a talk, though, that would be great, obviously. Uh, just let me know. Otherwise, uh, I guess we'll, we'll see you when we see you. Thanks, everyone. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks again for, for inviting me. And I hope, you know, I know most, at least from what I've gathered from reading the literature, is that semi supervised methods have not really become, I wouldn't necessarily say popular because they're kind of useful for kind of niche problems. Mm. But um, sort of the, the, the goal of my work was to try and help at least make people aware of them. Um, they're, they're certainly not necessary or appropriate for for most problems. Um, but as I as I show in, in my work, they, they they tend to be quite useful for 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 particular problems. And so um, I just hope that like, yeah, like I said, the goal of my work is to try and make people just aware <laughs> of their existence. <laughs> yeah, I mean for sure. I mean I think I mean it's not just geology that has a problem of not having enough data, right? I mean ultimately sure, yeah. That's why deep learning shines so much these last few years, because there is more and more data available, like in general. But there is areas where it's just hard or expensive to get them, right? Like you mentioned, yeah. there are certain parts of the world where there isn't just enough data, right? Like even if you wanted to collect, you couldn't easily. And I think there's always going to be a place for sort of methods which are sort of, yeah, sort of from a different range uh, from machine learning. And I, I personally love to hear those, right? Because, yeah, sure, it's nice to hear about deep learning and so on. It's great. But also, of course, like standard machine learning is also a success story. And sometimes it seems people do forget this, right? Everybody wants to train deep and deep and neural networks. And that's yeah, yeah, super like... popular. But I don't think necessarily that's, I mean, of course, it's not just me, right? That's not that's not always the way to go, obviously. And, and your yeah. work for sure demonstrates this here. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's there's applications where deep learning is definitely the way to go. <laughs> um, you know, these computer vision type problems where you know you you have the amount of data to, to train them. Um, there's there would be no rhyme or reason why you would want to use methods like I'm using here for an application like that. It, you know, it would that would not be useful. Um, but, yeah. I but mean, yeah, that might change in your field too, right? I mean, I think ultimately, if you, I mean, you have this too in deep learning that there is some like problem domains where you don't have a ton of data and then you try to use transfer learning, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the question like what, like what would you transfer, right? In terms of your <laughs> problem? I mean, that's easy. Like you said, for computer vision, right? You train like these uh, huge sort of, I guess, image net data sets um, and base a neural network on them and then use it for some sort of smaller data set. But if you have like a problem domain, which is sort of rather exotic, I think you'd have to identify then, okay, what could you actually transfer the knowledge from, right? And then fine tune and learn it, which would be nice. I mean, maybe in a few years from now or so with the pace of uh, of research in that area, maybe maybe that will be used in the future, who knows? Um, but, but definitely some interesting questions that need to be answered, I think, along the way. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, thanks again, uh, everyone, for coming. Um, and um, yeah, hope uh, hope we'll have another installment of these soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, folks.